Okay, so today's session is on free body diagram. Okay, so uh, I have taken free body diagram just to uh, you know introduce to you uh, how uh, how can we use the concept of vectors in the free body diagram. Okay, just like we have taken example of projectile motion to understand how vectors can be used to analyze the projectile motion. Okay, similarly. I am going to take a free body diagram to make you understand how can we use the concept of vector that we have just learned onto this. Okay, from where we were, from uh, like where we'll be using free body diagram, it is an integral part of this chapter laws of motion. Okay, have you seen that equation force into mass and acceleration? Okay, so we are going to learn how to apply force is equal to mass time acceleration. Okay. That force is net force. Okay, so we're going to write that equation now. Just like v is equal to u plus at, we wrote, right? So, but then when we use v is equal to u plus at in projectile motion, we have used in x-axis and then log y-axis. Yes or no? Right. Similarly, we are going to use force is equal to mass m acceleration along x-axis and then along y-axis, and if it is required along z-axis also. Okay, but before you even write that equation, before you even write that equation, you need to do some basic analysis, as in what are the forces acting on the body, which directions they, the forces are acting. So that basic analysis, what we are doing, 90% of that is free body diagram only. Fine. So if you do this free body diagram properly, you will be at ease with physics. Okay, because laws of motion is the basic chapter of the physics. If you are good at laws of motion, your entire physics becomes very easy. But if you are bad at laws of motion, it becomes extremely difficult. Fine. So you cannot afford to be bad at, you know, drawing free body diagram or this chapter laws of motion. Okay. So we are going to do this laws of motion again when we start class 11 syllabus. We will be doing laws of motion again. But right now I am just introducing to you a section of laws of motion which is free body diagram so that we can understand how we can use vectors there okay but before we even get into free body diagram all right we need to understand uh, what are the forces what are the properties of forces what are the laws which forces or any object in motion follows okay so uh, write down laws of motion. I am not going to uh, complete this chapter, I am just taking the relevant portion of this chapter which in which we can use the vectors. Laws of motion, as the name suggests, it is what? Law which an object in motion follows. Understood? If object is under motion, that object must follow these laws which we are going to talk about. Okay. Now there is uh, the concept of object at rest doesn't exist actually. Fine. So you you might like you know any object at rest can be thought of moving with respect to some other object. Like earth is moving, you might think that you are at rest, you are not. Okay. So when I say laws of motion, these laws are also valid for an object which is at rest. Fine. So you might have uh, already heard about these laws of motion since from your class 9th or 7th also at times. Okay. The Newton, Newton was a person who has formalized these laws in a systematic way and he has put across it as first law of motion, second law of motion and third law of motion. Right? Can you tell me what is the first law of motion? What it is? Huh? Any body. Any body will uh, remain in rest or keep yeah, moving unless an uh, external force is applied. But we haven't, see the thing is I, I know you haven't uh, you have this concept of force already you know it but the way I started teaching in class 11 that I am not assuming you know anything 
okay? And not even assuming you know what is force. Till we introduce what is force, let's not use these terms. Fine? So can you define the first law of motion? Tendency of a body to retain state. It, it introduces tendency of an object. Isn't it? It tells you the behavior of an object. And what is the object? What is the definition of an object? Anything that has mass. Anything that has mass, first law talks about the behavior of it. Getting it? Okay? So write down. It is also referred as Newton's first law of motion. And I am just writing first law of motion. It talks about behavior of any mass. Okay? Understood? Now, what, what is this um, behavior all about? What is the basic behavior of anything? any mass, it doesn't want to change. That, and that, that is somehow true with us also. Like, you know, for any, you, you don't want anything to be changed in your life also at times. Okay? The same kind of behavior every mass has. Whatever the mass is doing, the mass wants to do it. Okay? With, and that is its behavior. Alright? So, uh, Basically, the object, write down, the object or mass, I will be using object and mass interchangeably, okay? Object doesn't want to change its state. That is the behavior. Whatever state the object is in, the object wants to be in that state. Okay? Now, when I say state, I am there are two kinds of states. Alright? State of rest, write down. See, although the rest is not a true concept, but then you remember, you know that when Newton was formulating all these laws, you know, he was treating rest, an object at rest means the object is at rest with respect to earth. Fine? Suppose, you know, we, we are sitting, we are standing on the earth. Okay, we are at rest. So that, that is what it means, object at rest. Okay? So object at rest is a state of rest and state of uniform motion. These are the two states. So, if these two states are there in an object, object doesn't want to change. Are you getting it? So, you don't have to do anything if you want the object to be at rest forever. Because that's what object wants. You don't have to make any effort. Are you getting my point? If object is at rest like this, for example, it is like this. Okay? If you do not make any effort, object will be like this throughout. That's what it means. Okay? And if object is moving in a uniform velocity, uniform motion means uniform velocity. Not even direction is changing. Getting it? Direction and magnitude should be constant. Uniform motion means uniform velocity. Write down. Okay? So, if if the object is at rest or moving with a uniform velocity. Give me an example of uniform velocity. Motion in a straight line. Direction is unchanged and constant speed. Okay? Constant speed motion in a straight line is a uniform velocity. 
Okay, so if object is moving in a straight line with a uniform velocity, then the then you don't need to make any effort for that object to continue doing so. Why? Because that's what object wants to do. All right. But why object stops if some some object is sliding on the earth? Suppose on the floor, if some object is sliding and then stops after some time, why that happens? Because this object is moving with velocity v. This object will stop some after some time. Object wants to move, isn't it? But why it is stopping? Because, because somebody is making effort for it to stop. Who is making effort? The ground is making effort. Okay. So if ground doesn't make any effort, what should happen with this block? It keep on moving. Okay. And if you reduce the friction a little bit, the mass will further move away. That tells you the behavior of the mass. That you know, if ground lessens its effort of stopping this mass, or it completely removes its effort, then the mass will keep on going. Fine. So this tells the you know behavior of the mass. Getting it? Now let's talk about our day-to-day -day life examples. Okay. Anybody uh, thought and you have any examples of a day-to-day -day life where you observe Newton's first law? One example I tell you. For example, where when you have to uh, you know take out the dust from a rug, what do you do? You beat it, you beat it, right? So when you beat the rug, what happens is that the loose particles of the dust, they want to stay wherever they are, and the rug suddenly shifts when you beat it. The dust particle, they fall down. Are you getting it? This is the example of Newton's first law. Give me another example. Like when you are sitting in a like car which are which are not moving and start, suddenly starts moving, mm. you like experience the back. Why? Because you want to stay in that position. The car. But, but, the the car, car, but you are moving back, now You said. Because because the car is moving. Car can't moving. stay there for you. Ah, uh, you. You get pushed back. Correct. So car moves ahead, but your upper body. So your lower body is moving with the car, but upper body wants to remain there itself. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's how you feel as if you're falling back. Okay, what else? What other example? One example I tell you. Well, you have played carom, right? Or all the time you play with your smartphone only? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the last time you played carom? Last year. Last week. Good. So, so when you play the carom and you stack the coin one after the other and you hit the bottommost coin with a very high velocity, what happens to the upper coins? They, they stay like that only and they fall vertically down. So the upper coins wants to maintain their position, wants to remain at rest, wants to remain as it is. Okay? So that, that's why they, they don't fall down. But if you put the striker a little slowly, the upper one also falls down. Why? So because then there is like enough time to transmit that force to the top. Correct. So there, then the lowest lowest coin gets sufficient time to affect the motion of the, the upper coins. Getting it? But if you don't give it time, it will remain there only. What else? But if there, there is no friction suppose between the lowest coin and the upper coin, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. What else? Any other example? Think of any, anything. Like there's so many examples. So many. I don't think of. Okay, tell me one thing. Suppose there, one example is this. When you uh, when you shake a tree, I mean not the a branch of a tree. Better example. When you shake a branch of a tree, the the fruits which are uh, uh, 
I mean the the fruits which are heavy or which are ripe, they they fall down, right? But the fruits which are like uh, not ripe, they will not fall down. Why? You want to stay in their current position. They want to stay, so. right? They want to stay there, but then the lighter one also wants to stay there. Yes or no? Yes. Wants to stay more. But the heavier one wants to stay more. That's correct. So this behavior, these two behavior is stronger for heavier mass. Getting it? So there is intensity of behavior also. I mean these two behavior will be definitely there for each and every object. But the intensity or behavior is more for heavier mass. So this behavior is proportional to the mass. Yes or no? Okay. To check this, you can uh, think of a light object at rest, you can easily make it move. But if there is a heavy object, when you push it, it is difficult to move it. Yes. Getting it? So that tells you that the heavier object has more intense behavior. Okay? And since this behavior is very common, across the universe this behavior is. Okay? So we name this behavior. And the name of this behavior is inertia. Fine. So inertia is more for the heavier mass. But mass is not the inertia. Mass is a representation of the inertia. Getting it? Alright. So can you think of another example? Give me a couple of more. Get off a bus. When, so suppose you have this bus. So bus is moving. Don't do that. Okay. But suppose you are out of your mind and you jump. Okay, which side you will fall? Forward. Forward or backward? Forward. Why? Because you are moving. Because, 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 because you are moving forward. When you jump, your feet come to rest. But your upper body keep on moving. So you fall forward. So if you don't want to fall, then what you should do? You should keep running. Keep running in this direction only. What will happen then is that your upper body, lower body, both are moving with the same velocity. Okay, so you should run with the velocity of the bus only for for a couple of seconds. Okay, but if you run with more velocity or velocity of bus, you will fall backwards. Okay, so you should calculate first and then jump. What else? But you know it is not safe. You might be safe that, that you you know you are not toppling. But from behind, some some other vehicle might be coming. Okay, so you have to do a lot of other calculations as well. So don't do that. What else? Any other example to think of? Nothing. Suppose there are stacks of books. Stacks of books. And there's a piece of cloth that is at the bottom. How you remove it? You have to pull it very fast. We have one more like uh, where they set the plates on the dining table and yeah. the dining cloth is there. If you pull the dining cloth really fast, the plates still. Ah, stay there. I that once yeah. it <laughs> But the, the the cloth should be you know completely flat, yeah. and uh, it may not work out. No, exactly. It's not very really fast. Okay. Then what else? That's it. I mean, let's move forward. So there are so many examples of this. Okay. In fact, you know, uh, the projectile motion that we were doing. Suppose a bomb is dropped from a from a fighter aircraft. Yeah. Then what will the velocity of the bomb initially? Same as that of the plane. Same as that of plane. Why? Because of inertia. Because of our mass or the ball wants to continue moving with the same velocity with which it was uh, like when it was when it is in the plane. Yeah. Getting it? So there are so many examples. And uh, one example I thought just now. And anyway, so when we proceed with this uh, chapter, we will uh, come to know various other examples. And uh, 
Okay, one one last one that is coming in my mind is this. Suppose an object is moving in a circle, circular motion. Okay, and there is a string attached to it. This mass is moving in a circle, and a string is attached to it. Suppose the string breaks. How the mass will go? Tangentially. Why tangentially? That's because the velocity, velocity, the velocity circular motion is tangent to the circular part. Because that was its velocity at that point in time. It yeah. tries to maintain that velocity. Yeah. But if there is a string, string pulls it that way. So it its velocity changes and it makes a you know circle. But if string is cut, nobody is there to pull it. So it will go tangentially. It tries to maintain its velocity at that point in time. Fine. So like this, you know, uh, you know, at times we solve numericals by assuming the first law of motion, but you should be more aware of it. You know, you should know that okay, fine, I am using first law of motion. Fine, then you'll feel lot more in control when you solve numericals. Getting it? All right, write down the second law of motion. Second law of motion is the most important law. In the physics class 11th and 12th, okay, which looks very simple. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. But don't go by how simple it looks. It will make your life hell for two years. Okay, so a lot of tricky questions can be made out of just application of this simple equation. Okay, so be very uh, watchful and be. Be very observant of whatever is discussed in this chapter. Okay. So, second law of motion tells you. So, what, what does first law tells you? First law tells you that there is a behavior. What is the behavior? It tries to maintain its state. What is the state? Two states. Okay. The second law of motion tells you that how much effort you should make. To change, to change, to change the state. Fine. It quantifies the amount of effort you should be making to change the state of the object. Getting it? If you don't want to change the state of the object, you don't have to make any efforts. But if you want to change the state, how much effort you should be making? That Newton's second law tells you. Getting it? Now Newton's second law is. Force equal to mass in acceleration if mass is constant, but that's that law is not God hasn't come and told us that force equal to mass in acceleration. It is our own creation. Getting it? If you say no, force equal to m square into a to the power three, nobody is going to prove that you. Nobody can prove that you are wrong. Fine. But we have taken the simplistic equation possible, most simple equation, which is force equal to mass in acceleration. Okay, but whatever you create, the law, whatever law you create, should be uh, in sync with what is the observation. You should not say that force is equal to acceleration divided by mass. Why? Because you know that more is the mass, more force you need. Yes. Getting it? That kind of basic observation must be taken care of. So let's talk about few observation. Then we can arrive at the Newton second law. Okay, observation number one. Suppose you have two masses. This is smaller mass. This is bigger mass, moving with the same velocity. Moving with the same velocity. So where you have to make more efforts to stop the bigger mass? Simple. Now since we are talking about the effort, let's try to uh, let's give this a name, a formal name, because effort is a very subjective name. Fine. So we call effort in physics as force. Okay. So going forward, when I say for when I say force, it quantifies the amount of effort. Okay, so force required to stop the bigger masses more. What is the assumption? You are stopping both the masses in same time. Same time. Okay, in two seconds, suppose you stop this, 
and in 2 seconds you stop that also. So effort required here is more. Okay. So from this you can say that force is directly proportional to mass times A you can say. Mass to the power A. Isn't it? Even that is correct. A can be 1, A can be 2, A can be 3. But A cannot be 0 over minus 1 minus 2. Understood? So this is observation 1. Observation 2. Suppose you have two mass, I mean two equal masses. This is moving with 100 meter per second, it's like a bullet. And this is moving with 1 meter per second. Which will take more effort to stop? Of course, the higher velocity. Okay, so what the force is proportional to? Velocity. Here, according to observation, what it is? Velocity. Change in velocity. Change in velocity. Suppose I change 100 meter per second from 100 to just 99. Then it's the same. Then it is same. Okay, but I am changing more the velocity. Of, suppose I change 1 meter per second this side to 100 meter per second back, backwards. So the change is 101. Getting it? So it is change in velocity the force is proportional to. Yes or no? Okay. So force is proportional to change in velocity to the power b you can say. Okay. Observation 3. Two equal masses, two equal velocities, this you are stopping quickly. This you are taking time to stop. Where you take more, we have to make more effort here. So, so lesser time you take to change the velocity, more is the effort. Isn't it? So another example is when, uh, when, when a cricketer catches the ball. So he does like this, he follows the motion of the ball, okay, so that the effort required by his hand to stop the ball is less. Okay, so force is inversely proportional. That's a delta t raised to power c. Got it? So these are the three observations which must be true whatever equation you come out of. Okay, any doubts? So, so huh? Delta T, delta T is, see T equal to 0 is a hypothetical concept. T is equal to 0, you can say the beginning of time or whatever. You can say uh, delta T is amount of time taken. Suppose right now time is uh, 10 a.m. Then it becomes 10 a.m. 20 minutes. So delta T is finite time minus initial time. Okay, that is delta. So that's a common way of writing delta T. If I just say T, it means T at that moment. Why is it to the power of C? Why do we need to the power of C? Why it cannot be? Tell me. You could just say 1 by delta T. 1 by delta T if you say you are you are making it specific. Why it should be 1 by delta t? If you say 1 by delta t, then I should ask why 1 by delta t? I am saying that it can be anything. B, C can be anything. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Why it cannot be 1 by delta t square? All you have determined by the observation is if delta t is less, 4 should be more. That's all. Are you getting it? You have, you did not know what, what it is? First of all, you don't even know how to calculate force. Force is an effort. You are quantifying the effort. Fine. In your head, you might be knowing, okay, what is 1 Newton, what is 2 Newton. But what it is? It is creation of our own. God hasn't come and told us that 1 Newton is this. It is our own creation that 1 Newton is this much. You are getting it? So, these are the three observations. If you combine, see, you know, if any of these three, suppose m is 0, effort is 0. If delta v is 0, effort is 0. 
if delta t is infinite, effort is zero. Fine. So if any of these three, if m is zero, this is zero, or this is infinite, if any of these three condition happen, effort should be zero. Getting it? So if I combine all these three observation, I will be able to write force as proportional to m to the power a delta v to the power b divided by delta t raised to power c. Getting it? This must be true. Okay. Now it is up to us to take whatever a, b, c we want to take. Fine. So what we will do? We will assume a simple possible, most simple possible relation. What is that? Constant proportionality 1, a is equal to 1, b is equal to 1, c is equal to 1. Fine? Alright? So we have assumed that force, which is quantification of effort, is m times delta v by delta t. And by the way, this represents the average force. The on an average, this much force is required. Any doubts? Nothing? So, where is the constant? Constant is 1. You have assumed it to be 1. You have assumed it to be 1. Fine. It is up to me to define what is force is equal to. So if it is up to me, I can define force equal to this. Reading it. Or I can say force equal to 100 times m into delta v by delta t. Nobody can say something is wrong with that. But everybody has uh, come to this understanding that let's assume a simplest possible relation, which is this. Reading it. Now, this is the average force. Suppose you want to find out force at that instant. What, what does it mean? Instantaneous force. If you want to take instantaneous force, you have to find out instantaneous rate of change of velocity, which is acceleration. Understood? So if you combine everything, you will get force is equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration is instantaneous rate of change of velocity. And these are vector quantities. Acceleration, force, they are vector quantities. Capital M, which is mass, is a scalar. So scalar times vector is another vector, force. Okay? Now, here throughout we have assumed mass is constant. Getting it? Mass need not be constant. For example, rocket. A rocket is fired, it moves up, but force applied is down, gravity is acting down, still it is moving up. Why? Because mass is not constant. When your balloon, inside balloon there is air, if you release the balloon, it should come down because of gravity, but it goes up. Okay? So the variable mass system, we will not talk about it right now. Okay? That we will deal in when we talk about laws of motion chapter again. Right now our focus is whatever is required for application of vectors. Okay? So we are assuming mass is constant and 99% of the cases mass will be constant only. 99.5% you can say. Fine? Alright? So copy this down all of you quickly. Let me know if you have any doubts. No doubts? Nothing? Okay. Now what is the equation? Force vector is equal to mass times acceleration vector, right? This is a vector equation, just like V is equal to U plus AT was a vector equation, okay? Then what we did? Velocity along x-axis and acceleration along x-axis like that we have divided the equation into two. Along x-axis the equation and along y-axis the equation, okay? Same thing over here. We can say that force in x-axis is equal to mass times acceleration along x-axis. What is good if you write like this? I mean, how this will help? This is a vector equation. This is a scalar equation. Scalar equation we have been solving since our childhood. x plus y is equal to 2, x minus 3, y is equal to 6. So what is x and y? Okay? So we'll be able to solve it like a scalar equation. If you write like this, that is why. 
fine. Otherwise, you will get a vector equation which is little tricky to deal with. Okay. Where fx and fy will be equal to m into ay. Okay. Now here is the thing that uh, uh, you know typically the the problems in this chapter will be two dimensional in nature. Okay. So everything can be described by just, by just taking two coordinates x and y. Okay, there will be rarely a chance that along z-axis also something happens. Fine. So whatever is needed to be covered will be covered in x and y only. There will be cases where z-axis also involved. That will take up later on. Right now our focus is again application of vectors. Okay. So we are taking only two-dimensional problems. Fine. Now tell me if multiple forces are acting, then what you will do? Suppose multiple forces are acting. So you divide them. Then you have to add it up. Simple. So you have to add it up. Split it into their components and then just add the x, add the y. Correct. Good. So this is summation of all the forces. This is summation of all forces along x-axis. Summation of all the forces along y-axis. Okay. But do the object know that there are multiple forces? No. Object experience only net force. Yes or no? Can object have multiple acceleration? No. Can object have multiple forces? Yeah. So why it can't have multiple? Object doesn't know multiple forces are acting on it. Yeah. It is you who has divided the forces into, you who are observing the force as multiple forces. Similarly, acceleration can be split into two or three things. Okay? It, there, there are cases in which you have to add the acceleration of the same object along x-axis and then say that this is the acceleration along x-axis. I'll just give you an example. For example, if this is the case that you know this object is moving with acceleration, some acceleration, all right? Even this object is moving. This object's acceleration is a1 with respect to this object. So total acceleration will be A1 plus A. Fine, so we'll come back to this. No need to worry about it. But as I'm telling you that there exist such cases where you split the acceleration also and then when you write the equation, you add it up. Fine. So don't think that acceleration will be always one vector in the diagram. There can be multiple vectors which represent the acceleration. Then you have to take component of acceleration also along x-axis and along y-axis. Now these things which I am telling you, you will only understand when you solve questions which we will be doing it later. Okay, But this, just that I am telling you for your information. Okay. Fine, so this is the uh, second law of motion. This gives you an equation, the most important part. First law and third law doesn't give you equation. Second law gives you an equation. Okay, so this is about the second law of motion. Now let's talk about the third law of motion. What is third law of motion about? Reaction. Reaction equal and opposite reaction. Okay, but then have you uh, thought about like what does it mean? What does it mean? So, when you're swimming in a pool and you kind of kick off the ball, uh -huh. you experience some force and get propelled Backwards. forward. Backwards. Equal and opposite the ball also. Correct. So you you are you have the basic understanding of what does it mean. So let's try to you know get into the depth of it and try to understand more about the third law of motion because the third law of motion is where the most of the student makes error. Okay. They think that entire mechanics is just forced into mass and acceleration and they forget to apply Newton's third law usually. Okay, So third law of motion says, I mean the, the statement could be many, you know, the way you explain it. The, the most common explanation of third law of motion is every action has equal and opposite reaction. Okay, What is action? Action means what? Force. 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 See, when I say action, 
action has a wrong connotation also. Action, when you say it, it signifies some motion, some movement. But even if there is not a movement, the force which is applied is called the action. It is not a movement which called the action. Are you getting it? Every force, if, if you repeat the statement, every force has equal and opposite force. Simple. Every force has equal and opposite force. Getting it? So, so if there is a mass, if there is a mass, onto this mass, if somebody applies force F, so this force has equal and opposite force. So there will be an opposite force applied on the mass also. Is that true? No, the person. No, the mass the applies, mass applies an opposite yeah. force on the mass person. Apply an opposite. Correct. So the person applies F on the mass. Mass applies opposite direction force on the person. This is what it means. Fine? So, simple, right? If, let's, let's try to put it in a more simple manner. Draw two masses, two objects, object A and object B. Object A applies a force on B as FBA, let's say F only. Then B will apply force on A, F. Simple. Getting it? If A applies force on B in this direction, B will apply force on A in opposite direction. This is what Newton's third law is. Getting it? Yes. So if there is a force in this universe, somebody might be applying it, somebody something will be applied that force, will be applying that force, yes or no? Yes or no? So on that object or person, there will be equal and opposite force also applied. Fine? So in this universe, total force is zero. Zero. Total force on the universe is zero. Okay? So the another way you can say about third law of motion is that, write down every uh, all the forces exist in pairs. All the forces exist in pair. That's why the word is because yeah. of the opposite force. No, 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 he's saying something else. He's saying something else. You, car engine applies force on the wheel, wheel applies force on the engine. Simple. Okay, suppose I am trying to, let's say, one example. I am trying to twist this remote. Okay, why, why, uh, why I am experiencing a force? You, you will experience a force when you twist it? Yes or no? But you are applying force, how come you are experiencing the force? You are experiencing the force because this is applying force on you. Simple. Okay? So, every time you see a force, you should ask yourself, where is the pair of that force? If you are not able to find the pair, you are doing it wrong. You will get a wrong answer. Getting it? Simple thing. When you draw a force in a diagram that this is the force, ask yourself, where is the pair of this force? Oh, there is this pair, so I am ignoring it, let's move forward now. If you are not able to answer that question, you are doing it wrong. Simple? Okay, now tell me if I am standing here, what are the forces acting on me? Gravity is acting on me? So where is the pair of that force? No. 
Who is applying gravity on me? Earth. Earth. So I should apply a polish force on the Earth. Yeah. Earth is applying force on me, right? Earth is applying force F on me or MG on me. So I should apply MG in a polar direction on Earth. Getting it? So this is the Earth. You are standing here. On you there is MG force. So on Earth also there will be MG force. This is a pair. Things are very very simple. So keep it simple. Don't complicate in your head. Right? He is up, uh, the Earth is applying MG. So guy is applying MG. Simple. Whatever we have learned. Nothing else. Okay? Now, the floor is also applying force on me. I am standing on the floor. Floor is applying force on me. Upwards. Yes or no? And you are also applying force on the floor. Downwards. The floor applies N on you and you are applying normal reaction or the force on the floor also. Yes or no? You are also applying force on the floor. If floor is very weak, floor will break because you are applying force on it. Okay? So these are action reaction pair Mg, Mg, N and N. Equal and opposite pairs. What about the air? What about the? Even the air is applying. Air, yeah. air, air is pushing you down, you can say that. You are also pushing the air up. If you don't push the air up, air will come down. Okay, but we are ignoring these side effects. Okay, we are ignoring the air drag and all those things. And any other doubt? Anything else? No? Now tell me examples of third law of motion. It is very, very common. Huh? Tell so me. when you shoot a bullet, you get broad air. So, so you shoot a bullet, what, what happens? Yes, the, the, gun, the gun is applying force on the bullet. So the bullet applies force on the gun. So you feel the push backwards. Huh? Right? So, um, oh, okay, so the, like when you're launching a rocket, yeah, like you're, you're expelling all the gases downwards. Right? Huh. So the force is downwards. So, so we're pushing the gas downward, gas is pushing you up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ball is applying force on the wall. And wall applies force on the ball. Huh? The boat moving in water, the boat exerts uh, the force on the water and the water exerts the reaction force on the boat. How you are exerting force on the water? No, the boat exerts a force on the uh, water body. How? With the turbine, weight. propeller. No, with yeah. its weight. No, it just Okay, very correct, correct, correct. So weight, weight is balanced by the force due to the water. Uh. So when you're playing cricket, uh. the ball is coming fast, then you can feel the back move back. Correct. Like, uh. like when you walk, you use that force. You push the ground and the ground pushes you back. Correct. When you're walking, you're actually pushing the ground backwards, and ground is pushing you forward, and you're walking. Uh. So when you jump, then, uh, then. Uh, you will create a force on the ground. When I'm jumping, which direction I'm pushing the floor? Down. 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 Floor pushes you up. What else? So if, uh, if 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 you if you were on a frictionless surface mm. and you were to throw something really heavy forwards, mm. you would start sliding back. Like I, I, I saw this in this. Uh, yeah, it is possible. Yeah, video. it 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 happened. In fact, in like the space, in people space do it. Yeah. 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 Like what else? Yeah. What else? When you swim, you push the water back. Water pushes you forward. Okay. So Newton's third law is very very common. Very common. Okay, so when we will solve problems, we will keep that thing in mind. Okay, so when you solve problem, we'll be representing the forces. So every time you represent a force, ask yourself where, where is the pair of this force, and then you proceed forward. Okay, fine. Right, so these are the three laws of motion, which I mean, which you should understand in a great depth. Okay, more understanding will be developed when you will solve problems. In class 11th, it will never happen that you understand everything by reading theory and then you solve problem. 
that will never ever ever will happen your 70 to 80 percent of learning will happen when you solve problems so do not i mean what what happens is that when we go back home we start reading book okay let me complete the chapter then i'll start solving problems no start solving problems and then read the chapter when you're stuck somewhere okay getting it that's the way you have to learn that's the only way to learn don't read the chapter again and again even for your school exam your uts or whatever it is do not read the chapter again and again solve problems after the problems after problem because 11 12th is about application of knowledge it's not about knowledge just they are not going to tell you they are not going to ask what are the returns three law of motion list down no they are going to ask you how you apply that so you need to learn that that will be learned only when you solve problems okay